This is Dakar in Senegal, and children gather on the streets to beg. For money or food, this is a daily ritual repeated by thousands of young boys across the country. There's nothing unusual about children begging in Africa, but these youngsters are sent out onto the streets to beg in the name of Allah. Between the ages of five and seven, their parents send them to the Islamic priest or marabouts so they can be taught the Quran. The marabouts force them to beg like this to pay for their food and tuition. In between begging, the boys sit for hours at a time, religiously reciting the Arabic alphabet. If they fail to learn quickly, they're rewarded with a blow from their marabout. Basiru Niang is a marabout in charge of 20 boys. He brought them from the villages where drought and lack of food meant families could no longer look after them. The boys live cramped in together for the rest of their childhood. Every marabout has an assistant, which is usually his son. This helps to ensure the Quranic school tradition survives through the generations, despite the lack of obvious rewards. We are poor, and we don't have enough to eat. We all live together here in this room. Many of the children are sick. I have to send the young ones out to beg, otherwise it all falls apart. I need to use the whip. I don't want to hurt them, but they have to obey. In the school, a donated meal is being prepared. The boys, or talibis, as they're called, have been up since 4.30 reciting the Quran, before going to beg on the streets for their teacher. Some of these youngsters will themselves become marabouts, but the rest will struggle to survive, as the Quran is all they know. <laughs> Despite these children coming from the poorest sections of society, their parents earn great praise for having a child in a Quranic school, even though it turns out to be little more than slavery. <laughs> Even the smallest children spend most of the day begging. Often, they are the most likely to receive in a society obliged by Islam to give charity. In the villages, it's household tasks rather than begging which forms the day's work fair for the marabout students. And before breakfast, they spend three hours sitting in the same position bent over their Quranic text, chanting the words like a mantra. And harshness rules here too. The children are beaten if they appear tired or aren't concentrating on their studies. These extraordinary teaching methods, as handed out by the Marabout, are generally accepted throughout Senegal. The students who refuse to study are given the severest punishment. Tied to a stool, they are forced to sit in the blistering heat for hours on end. <laughs> Apart from the Quran, the children learn nothing but brutality. Senegal doesn't make schooling compulsory, and as over 90% of the population are Muslim, criticizing a Quranic school is tantamount to blasphemy. Muslims consider obedience to the marabout akin to their reverence for Allah. The Quranic school is one of the pillars of Islam. Many people want to earn money through a Quranic school because times are bad and they want to solve their own problems. The government should help, but the beatings are part of it. It's part of bringing up children. One man 
who will never forget his time in the Quranic school, is a Senegalese painter, Omar Dion. His eldest brother put him in a school after the death of their father. The 49-year-old now pains to forget his time there. He says the children are exposed to all kinds of abuses, bullying and violence. Quranic schools are not open to debate. They're part of the belief system and we must simply accept them. If you question them, you're considered crazy. You're shunned by society and your whole family are ignored. It's senseless to protest. And while this attitude prevails, few will question the Quranic schools openly in public. Not even the UN's children agency, UNICEF, who privately voice concerns about the treatment of children in Quranic schools. The children are traumatized if they grow up without their families, particularly if they are four or five years old. It's inhuman. For them, it's very important to be taken back to their own families. The Marabout Basiru Niang is taking his pupils, Tiarno and Umar, home to visit their families in villages five hours from Dakar. It's an opportunity to find out what could have driven their families to send them to a Quranic school. This region is blighted by drought, turning a delayed harvest into a shortage of food and water. The Marabout himself left just such a village for the city because of these conditions. This is Umar's family home, but he hasn't been here for two years. After his father died, his mother abandoned him. Umar was looked after by the rest of his family before being sent to the Quranic school. In front of them, he is now asked to prove how well he's learned the Quran. The Quranic teacher told us that Umar has to beg. That hurts us. The children come from good families, but because of the drought, we don't have enough for everyone. It's important to learn the Quran. We can't do anything else. Umar is asked if he'd prefer to stay here and is immediately punished by the marabout for answering too slowly. My friends are here. This is my home. Umar has a large family, and with each man taking up to four wives, the food shortages are acute. After a short visit, Umar's family sadly say goodbye. He has no other choice. <laughs> Senegalese Muslims are followers of the Sufi Brotherhood, an Islamic sect which follows the strictest codes. Nowhere in Islam is the unconditional submission of the pupil to the Marabout stronger than here. They travel deeper into the desert and on to another village where Tiana's family live. Like Umar, two years ago, Tiana's relatives sent him to the Marabout. He is the eldest son, and his relatives are happy to see him, although after many months away, some are overwhelmed by his return. Despite the distress of separation, they realize it's his destiny to study at the Quranic school. His mother wishes he didn't have to return, but accepts it. It's sad my son isn't with us, but it's the will of the Almighty, even if he has to beg. We can't do anything more than pray that life for the Marabout and his students gets better. Life is hard. 40% of Senegal students attend the Quranic schools. The government is only now recognizing the conditions that these children have to live in. It seems an unemotive parting when they don't know 
how many years it will be before they'll next see each other. Umar and over 100,000 other Quranic school children have no chance of escaping their situation. The night fires are testimony to the harshness of regimes, where enforced studies at night allow more time in the day for begging.